Okay. All right, we're good? Yeah, thanks. All right, so uh, welcome back. We're continuing on our sort of uh, grab bag of topics toward the end of CS205, things that are important in numerical analysis, maybe don't follow quite as nicely in the story that we've had so far, but are still equally useful uh, for many tasks involving real numbers on the computer. Thanks. And then, and, and uh, because of that, we're going to try and hit them in this course, and, and, and in fact, they, they sort of form a coherent story of their own. Yeah. So remember, our last class was all about this problem of interpolation, right? where I take a function and I grab a couple points on this function, and now I want to fill in sort of a reasonable looking set of values in between those sample points. But somehow, the interpolation problem isn't necessarily the world's most interesting thing, right? because oftentimes we want to do something with our function other than just get additional values. right? So, so today, we're going to talk about an application, you can almost think that it's an application of interpolation, although it's not quite true, which is this, uh, these, these problems of numerical integration and differentiation. That is, if I only can, can sample a function, rather than, than actually just you know, asking a function for its derivative, then how can I get a good approximation of these sorts of things, since obviously they've played a fundamental role in almost any algorithm that we've discussed in this class so far. Right. Oh, before I forget, so yep, you have another homework due this coming Monday. Uh, this homework includes a coding part, yeah? I, again, I just said this a few minutes ago, but, but, but please start at least problem 1A, like ASAP. It's not too hard, it's kind of a review of stuff we've already done. But if you can't do 1A, then parts 1B, C, D, E, and F, which are like basically the whole homework, will not be doable for you. So I would highly, highly recommend you take the half hour, hour, six hours it takes to do problem 1A. Uh, and then and, and ask your questions now and make sure you're very confident in your answers so that you can do all the coding stuff that comes after it. The coding isn't too hard, but obviously if you're solving the wrong system of equations, your code isn't going to be very effective. Yeah. So it's uh, this sort of theme in numerical analysis, right? There's uh, there are like lots of different sources for bugs that we're not used to. Right now we don't even we don't just have to worry about algorithmically like making these efficient, but we have to make sure that our actual formulation is correct and that the numerics are going to work. Right? So that's kind of a challenge, and I recommend you give yourself some time. Uh, this coding assignment uses MATLAB. MATLAB is installed on all of the CS department machines, including the MIPS and the Cardinals, and I'm probably about eight years out of date as to what is in the basement of Gates, but whatever is there should have MATLAB on it. Uh, don't run out and buy MATLAB, it's very expensive. Uh, so, so go ahead and just use theirs. You can run it remotely on your computer if, you're too, if, you, if you don't like to, to go to Gates. Uh, alternatively, there is an open source MATLAB knockoff, and it's called Octave. I did not test my code in Octave because my laptop doesn't like it, but if somebody tries Octave and it works, you should post on Piazza and say that, because that'll be encouraging. And, like, somebody asked if they can do it in, in, in Python. If you really want to, you're, you're welcome to translate this code into whatever you like, Python, COBOL, Fortran, Eiffel, I don't, I, don't, I don't really care. Just make sure that the TAs can run your code and that it does uh, work as advertised. And know that if you don't do it in MATLAB, you're doing yourself a little bit of a disservice because you're going to have to re-implement all the code that I wrote for you, and you're going to have to make sure it works. Uh, so anyway, uh, proceed at your own risk. Obviously, regardless of the programming language, you should use your own CG implementation. Right? Uh, in fact, even MATLAB has built-in conjugate gradients because it's very important, but just calling the MATLAB CG method is not terribly exciting. Yeah? Cool. Are there any questions about that, procedural aspects of this class? Hopefully you all have your graded midterms, all that kind of thing. Um, yeah? No? Cool. All right. So again, in our last class, we were, all, we were worried about finding functions of f of x, right? Find, filling in functional values was, was really the unknown that we had here. And today, our goal is really just an extension of this problem, which is rather than just filling in function values, we'd like to understand their derivatives and integrals. And for the most part today, we're going to only worry about functions with a single variable, although unlike in previous lectures, when I said, like, first we're going to consider functions with a single variable, and then we're going to use that to construct algorithms for multiple, multiple variables, here, usually the multivariable algorithms are like really obvious extensions of the, the 1D thing. So, so, so you should keep that in the back of your head while I write this stuff down. Um, and we'll address it a little bit later in class, but for the most part, it's actually pretty easy to do multivariable differentiation and, and integration based on, on what we'll cover today. Cool? All right. So 
I don't think it's too hard to motivate why we need derivatives and integrals of functions. Hopefully, uh, you've seen about 10,000 examples of this in 205A so far, and, 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 and there, there are many more. Uh, in the course notes, I, knew, I kind of enumerated a bunch off the top of my head, and I'll mention it at some subset of them here. Uh, for example, um, when we do statistics, oftentimes uh, a curve that I think everybody knows and loves is the Bell curve, or the Gaussian, right? Like we mentioned it earlier in this class, it's called like that. Yeah. Here's the mean, and some with this, the standard deviation. And uh, oftentimes we want the cumulative distribution function of a Gaussian. Right? The cumulative distribution is nothing more than the integral from minus infinity to x of this function here. Right? And it's useful because it kind of tells you how much probability is to the left of a point. Yeah. And so if we want to measure the CDF, there's a function. It's called ERF or the error function. Uh, this is actually a standard notation. And ERF is basically the function that gives me the, the, the CDF of a Gaussian. Right? This is this cumulative integral. And it is defined as an integral. And try as we might, we cannot write ERF as just some finite combination of exponents and cosines and sines and things. This is like a weird transcendental function that, that, whose definition actually is this integral. Right? It's a little bit weird right? when we define exponents or sums and things. We don't usually think of them as integrals, but in fact, ERF, that's about as nice a form as it takes, and numerical methods for evaluating functions like this actually have to just do this integral. Not all of them. You can also write down like a Taylor series for this, but, but uh, many, many algorithms really do numerical integration in the process of evaluating functions like this. In case you're not convinced, there are other applications in which we like using basically calculus. Uh, for example, uh, let's say that I have a probability distribution on the unit interval, right? So this is just one number for every point, uh, every x value between 0 and 1. That's kind of proportional value to the, to the amount of times I'd like to draw that number. You know, hopefully the story is kind of familiar from what, CS 109, 110, whatever that class is. Uh, but anyway, if, if you have a probability distribution on 0 and 1, a very common problem is simply, can I randomly draw numbers from that distribution? And, and so if the, the distribution is p of x, then, then one very common strategy for doing this, because we really don't want to have to write down a special algorithm every time somebody gives me a new p. Uh, one thing we can do is make a really clever observation where you define, yet again, the cumulative distribution function. You already done explicitly, right? f of t is just the integral from 0 to t of p. Right? Just the more than the integral of this thing. And, 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 and a really cool property happens. And unfortunately, we won't prove it in this class, because this isn't a stats class. But if you uniformly choose a random number in the interval 0, 1, that is, any number between 0 and 1 has equal probability, then f inverse of that number is distributed like p. Now, this is a fun fact of the day. We won't cover it here, but you, you've probably seen it before if you've ever taken a stats class. And, and the nice thing about this, this observation is that we don't need different methods for generating random numbers with different probability distributions of p. All we need is a method for uniformly generating random numbers. And then if we want it with any other distribution, we just run it through f inverse. But sadly for us, f inverse is, a, is, is an integral, right? At least it comes from an integral. So we're going to need these sorts of quadrature schemes if we'd like to be able to do this in general. If you're not convinced, uh, we can go to a completely different field. And that is rendering in computer graphics. So uh, I suppose this class is, is, is mathematical methods for, for graphics and vision, so I, I like to try and return up each of these. But let's say that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to draw some surface, right? I'm using some high quality rendering method like ray tracing. Okay? Then there's a formula, I didn't write it explicitly here, but, but there's a formula called the rendering equation, which says, let's say I'm standing at a point and I want to know how much light is going out of my surface in this direction. Well, one way to think about it is that, really, in my scene, I might have all kinds of light sources placed every which way. Right? And in fact, maybe I have a big fuzzy light source, like somebody, you know, like, when you, when you have, when you go to a photography studio, sometimes they have these, like, big fuzzy white things that just kind of cast light every which way, right? kind of looks approximately like that. And uh, so anyway, we have all these different things that are casting light in all kinds of complicated ways. Then the rendering equation says, I draw a little sphere around this point. Right? And the amount of light that's going out can be written as an integral over the sphere of the amount of light coming in, uh, modulated by how it's reflecting outward. Yeah? It's nothing more than just another integral. And in fact, if you write a ray tracer, right, a lot of the theory of ray tracing, if you like, take CS348B, for example, basically involves quadrature. 
that is numerical integration because what are you doing? You're integrating light and trying to figure out uh, what's coming in towards your camera. Okay, for yet another field that uses uh, numerical quadrature differentiation, uh, I guess mostly I, I mentioned quadrature in the, in the things that I selected for class, but whatever. Uh, is image processing. So, so in image processing, a typical task would be I take a photograph like this fish here and I blur it. I generate a blurred fish. And, and the typical sort of classical method for this is Gaussian convolution, or just convolution in general. Right? The idea here is that we can think of an image as a function i of x, y, right? Never mind that we have to discretize it. Yeah? And so, so for each point x, comma, y, it's associated with some color, right? We'll call that color i. And then if I want to blur the image, what I can do is just draw some little neighborhood around that point. Yeah, and just average the colors in this neighborhood. Right, so I'm going to replace his color with the average of all the colors in some circle nearby. Yeah. Well, average in continuous math land is keyword for integral. And in fact, the basic way that, that you, you write this down is by integrating this uh, over this box, the color of the image. Yeah. And so basically you write almost any popular classical image filter as an integral that's moving across the image. This is called convolution. And if you want to do convolution discreetly on a pixel grid, then you're going to need these sorts of integration strategies that we talk about in 205. For yet another application of this integral stuff, if you look at Bayes' rule, right? If, if you, you know, again, if you're into big data and you're, and you're, you're applying Bayes' rule, because Bayesian big data is, is, the, is the right kind, apparently, then, then big, usually when you look at Bayes' rule, we don't always write it this way, but in fact, the denominator of Bayes' rule is an integral. Remember what Bayes' rule says? He says that the probability of an event x given, event, given, the pro given that y happened is proportional to the probability that y happened given x uh, times probability of x. Yeah? This is a very classical theorem from, from probability. But of course, if you just multiply these two numbers, it might not integrate to 1 anymore. So the denominator of Bayes' rule basically is making sure that you still have a probability distribution. And, uh, Unfortunately, this integral can be huge. It's, it's very slick looking here. It actually fits in about a foot on the, uh, the whiteboard. But, but in fact, if, if my probability distribution is very complicated, for example, if you take CS228 with Daphne, right, you're going to learn about distributions over entire graphs whose nodes are all individual random variables and they're all interconnected in fancy ways. This is a distribution over all of those numbers simultaneously. And you have to take an integral in like r to the number of vertices in your graph, which is ginormous. And in fact, this is an open research problem for how to deal with that denominator. It looks innocent enough, but we don't know what to do with it. In fact, I found uh, a couple months ago, I was reading some course notes on contrastive divergence, which is not something we will cover in this class, which is an optimization method in this like humongously terrifying graphical models field. And this guy is basically just, so he's talking about contrastive divergence, which is a method for optimizing uh, probability distributions that look like Bayes rule, right? And he, he gives this, this metaphor where he says, well, you know, if I can do, for example, conjugate gradients, this is like walking around in a field on a bright day, right? Because I have this line search and there's, you know, it's a sunny day, I can see where I should go in my line search and this is great. Now, if I do gradient descent, this is like turning off the lights, right? So now I feel gravity and I can walk down the hill. But in fact, in, in, in when you have these humongous denominators that you can't even integrate, then you don't even know what function you're optimizing anymore. Right? Because you can't, even, you can't even evaluate the denominator, you can only approximate it. Right? And so, in fact, he, he says it's, uh, we, we find ourselves in the field without any light whatsoever, and we can't establish the height of a point in the field relative to our own, so their method gives us a sense of balance, allowing us to feel the gradient of the field under our feet. Right? So, this is state of the art. <laughs> so you can see that there's actually a lot to be done, simply in, in, in incorporating quadrature into some very popular schemes for, for machine learning. By the way, this paper is really fun to read. He's the, the guy is a very smart sort of way to introduce some of these problems. All right. So hopefully you are now duly inspired that the following problem is important, and we call it quadrature, or numerical integration. And the idea is that if I have n values, f of x1 to f of xn, I'd like to find some approximation of the integral of f, uh, you know, in some interval that contains those, those values. Yep, totally reasonable problem. And in fact, I think even AP calculus back in high school covers a couple of very, very simple methods for this. So, 
Uh, one thing to note is that there are actually two slightly different variants of this problem that we'll mention today. This is a little bit subtle. So uh, you, there, there are sort of two cases when we might sample a function f. Right? One is sort of, let's say I'm doing you know, some, something involving a sensor, and, and I simply don't know the derivative of f because I don't know what function I'm sampling. Right? This is just like based on experiment. Right? Then sort of my xi's are fixed. Right? They're my data points, and I'm trying to approximate the integral of my function. A contrasting setup would be, I actually have a function f. For example, maybe I'm writing optimization toolkit, but the guy that, that, that wrote f didn't bother giving me a derivative. Right? In that case, I can sort of choose the xi's uh, to make my integral sort of the best condition. Right? So the two possible cases are either the xi's are fixed and somebody just gives you a pile of data points, or not only can I evaluate f, I can choose where I want to. Obviously, I'd like to minimize the number of xi's that I have to plug into f, right? Because each one is some computational cost, but at least I have that freedom. Yeah? Cool. So in fact, if you look at our lecture from Monday, we already have a very simple method for recovering the integral of a function, right? That is, let's say that I'm in that first case, right? Somebody just hands me a bunch of data points and I'm trying to approximate the integral, right? Then from our last lecture, we learned that probably what we're going to do is interpolate this function as a linear combination of a bunch of basis functions. Right? Remember we wrote down a bunch of phi's, like piecewise polynomials or what have you, and then we just added them together with the coefficients a? Well, look what happens if I integrate this function. Right? Well, so in the integral of f, is only more in the integral of this sum, just by definition. And then the second line here, we notice that the integral of a sum is the same thing as the sum of the integrals. Yeah? So it's sort of a basic fact. And, and look what happened here. I was able to pull out the ai's. And so now, I just have this constant, ci here, and he's nothing more than the integral of each of your basis functions. So in other words, if I can figure out the integrals of my basis functions, then I'm kind of done for, for a quadrature. Right? In fact, this is an exact formula. There are no squiggly equal signs here. So where do things go wrong? Well, I'd say there are two issues. The first is that there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem here. If, you're, if your basis functions are complicated enough, you might not know their integrals. Yeah, this is a problem in finite elements, actually. Uh, and, 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 and secondly, this sort of assumes that your function f of x is given by an interpolatory scheme. Right? So certainly that second case that I mentioned, where you can sample xi's the way that you want, maybe you can do better, because now you can kind of adaptively figure out where you'd like to uh, choose data points and so on. You notice that this discussion is way easier than like conjugate gradients, right? This is, this is somehow a much more relaxing field to look at and sort of geometrically nice. Yeah? Okay. So to continue motivating sort of our, our generic form for quadrature, we might go back to our favorite definition of, of the integral of a function, right? So maybe I'll draw a picture just in case uh, you've forgotten this from calculus class. But the, 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 the Riemann integral of a function, we won't talk about Lebesgue or, or some of these other what is it, Stilgy's integrals or anything, because they're, they're less relevant to computational stuff. Um, at least uh, for what we're doing. Uh, anyway, uh, so, so if, you, if you want to write the, the Riemann integral of a function, let's say that we have uh, from a to b here, right? that Riemann says that I just divide the interval from a to b into a bunch of pieces, right? and I just fill those pieces with rectangles that go through the function. Yeah? And obviously, the, the, the integral of this, this rectangular thing is pretty easy, right? It's just the width of the rectangle times their height, all summed up, summed up. And the big, the big theorem that, that Riemann, or probably somebody else, but, but Riemann got credit for, is that as, as the width of these intervals gets small, it actually doesn't matter the height as long as it intersects this curve somewhere, and it doesn't matter which intervals you choose, regardless it converges the interval of that. Yeah? Hopefully this story's familiar. It's just the area under the curve. But as we often do when we're discretizing something like this, we can take a limit as something goes to zero, and instead we're just going to take it to be positive but small. Yeah. And so in particular, a, a reasonable approximation of the Riemann integral is to just choose some delta x and sum up over all the pieces of uh, f of that times, times the width of your interval. Okay. So notice something, that, that, that both the Riemann integral and this integra integration formula that we have for interpolatory project, quadrature, right? they both take a similar form, where you have a bunch of constants, and then you have a, a bunch of, of values that just determine your function, right? whether that's f of x i or these a i's, which are the coefficients of your, your basis functions. Right? 
So in general, uh, we usually write a quadrature rule uh, as this guy here. This formula is humongously generic, but sort of important to keep in mind, which is that we're going to approximate the integral from a to b of f with some combination of f at all the xi sample points that we chose. Right? And so what is our unknown when we're designing a, 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 a scheme for quadrature? Well, all we have to do is decide on these weights wi, and then from there, we're done. Right? Now we have some approximation of the integral. Right? So for example, the rewind integral, the wi would kind of look like the width of your interval. And um, I, yeah, I guess it's slightly less clear uh, what goes on in the, the interpolation scheme. Yeah. So, right, so again, so wi is really describing the contribution of f of xi to your interval. Right? This is sort of reasonable. For example, if you, if you shrink the widths of your interval, you expect that the wi's all individually go to zero because no single xi is contributing all that much. Yeah? Cool. All right, so we're going to start with the, uh, the strategies that, that are usually introduced in calculus classes, and these uh, come with a name now. It's a class of methods called Newton Coates Quadrature. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this name before, but you probably recognize the strategy uh, that Newton Coates involved. The idea here is that we're going to choose our xi's to be evenly spaced in the interval from a to b. Reasonable enough. And sort of without any more motivation, we might think that this is kind of the best, the best possible sampling. It turns out that this isn't the case, but it is a sampling and probably the most common. In fact, I'd say in that first case where somebody just gives you a bunch of data points and it's your job to find the integral, I'd say nine times out of ten they give you a bunch of data points that are evenly spaced because what else would they do? Yeah? Uh, right. So let's say that I have uh, n sample points total. Then there are sort of two symmetric ways that I can place those sample points in my interval from A to B. And those correspond to closed and open quadrature. And let's draw this on the board. So in the first case, which is the closed case, we're going to say that we have at least two points, and that our points always include the left and right endpoints of the interval from, uh, from A to B. Right? So in particular, let's choose a different color. We'll go for Christmas today. If I have two points, then where, where are my data points going to be? X1 will be here, and X2 will be there. Yeah? If I have three points, then I'm going to put X3 there. If I have five points, then it'll be like that, and so on. Right? Pretty simple. So in particular, right, if I, if I call my points x1 to xn, then you can see that this closed formula here is nothing more than just sampling uh, points along this interval with even spacing. Right? It's easy to get off by one, by the way, in this kind of stuff. And even easier to be off by one when you're coding and just trying to do this in your head. So be, be, beware. This is a good gotcha. Yeah? But, but you can see, for example, if I plug in k equals n, Right, then this is n minus 1 over n minus 1 times b minus a. Yeah, so this is a plus b minus a, and again, yeah. So our other option for, 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 for newton coates uh, schemes is called open, and the idea here is that we actually don't include the endpoints. Right? So for example, if I had one point, I would just stick it right in the middle. Yeah? If I have two points, then I would put them kind of at the one-third and two-thirds places, and so on. Yeah, and these are, uh, these are called open schemes, and, uh, right, and they, so basically they don't include the left and right sides. And why is that useful for integration? Well, think about it. Like if, if, if we were drawing rectangles over this, right, we're plotting f, then maybe I really want, for example, if I only have two data points, to draw two rectangles, in which case it kind of makes sense that you would want f of, of x right in the middle of that rectangle by the left of n points. But regardless, these are two different schemes and they can lead to two different numerical methods. Yeah. So, uh, right. so, so, let's, so the other thing is that usually new, when we use the phrase newton coates quadrature, we mean that our xi's are symmetric and evenly spaced, that we have these two possibilities, and that the interpolation scheme we're going to use is polynomial. So the idea here is that maybe I have these two data points, yeah, so I fit a polynomial, namely a line, to these two data points, and I integrate that. Okay. All right, so, so a k point, uh, quadrature is a k minus one uh, degree polynomial, and you just integrate it. Yeah? And we're pretty good at integrating polynomials. So let's see what this means. So the simplest possible uh, version of a Newton code scheme would be the uh, the midpoint rule. And that in our in the classification we just developed is nothing more than a one point scheme for integration. 
right? So in particular, uh, midpoint says, okay, here's this, uh, and here's, here's my function, and I have A and B, so I'm just going to find you know, the midpoint, A plus B over 2, evaluate it, and stick a rectangle right there, and use the area of that rectangle as a proxy for the integral function. Obviously not a great approximation, but if A and B are close together, it's okay. All right. Hopefully we'll all get the midpoint rule. I think this stuff is, is easy enough. So we can get a little more complicated and do the trapezoidal rule. Yeah, and the trapezoidal rule, this is a closed rule because it's going to include the endpoints. The idea is that now I'm going to put two data points at the two endpoints from A to B, right, and draw a trapezoid that includes these points and use the area of the trapezoid as a, uh, a proxy for the integral of and so it's pretty easy to see that, 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 the, that this approximation is nothing more than the width of the interval times the average of f here and there. Yeah. Okay, and finally, our, our third favorite uh, Newton's Coates rule is going to be Simpson's rule. And I didn't actually bother going through the derivation of Simpson's rule because it's not humongously exciting. But this is a, uh, another closed scheme where you have three points. And the idea here is you have a, B, and A plus B over 2. Yeah, here's our function again. And we're going to take these three data points. Yeah, I, choose, I chose really boring data points. Uh, there. <laughs> and uh, like this. And I'm going to fit a parabola that goes through them and find the integral underneath that parabola. Right? These are just three different schemes, all for approximating the integral from A to B of F using a pretty small number of data points. <coughs> there are Newton code schemes for arbitrarily high degree polynomials, right? I could just keep adding points here, but as we discussed last time, remember when you fit a polynomial of really high degree to a set of points, you can start to get some really bizarre phenomena like ringing and so on. And so generally, we don't use uh, more, than, more than degree two. And then what we're gonna do is just chain together a bunch of little intervals and, and add these guys all up, yeah? Super simple, huh? This is great. So again, so, so if we'd like to, to integrate a function over an, inter uh, an interval from A to B that's bigger than just like infinitesimal, right, we have two options. Either we could go to really high degree polynomials, which is somehow not a very good idea, or we can just divide our interval into lots of small pieces and integrate it over each of those. So for example, uh, let's say that I want to do the trapezoidal rule and I have a function like this, it's really hard to draw functions that make these things interesting. Um, so if we're from A to B, then what we're going to do is actually split it up into these intervals of width delta x, right? And then uh, for each interval, we'll stick a little trapezoid. You know? uh, and so on. Cool. And then we'll just add them all. And when we do that, it's, a, it's pretty easy to derive all the different formulas you can get for composite quadrature, or if you can't remember them, you can always just do them one, <coughs> one interval at a time and sum them up. Yeah? So in particular, uh, if, we, if we say that we want k intervals, yeah, the, the, the width of each interval is nothing more than the width of you know, b to a to b uh, divided by k. Hopefully that's, that's easy to see. And, and each of the endpoints is nothing more than a plus the width of, of the interval times square root of r. Yeah? Easy enough. I saw, I saw a raised eyebrow, are we good? Are you checking? So the, you know, it starts at x0. Exactly. Yeah, so <laughs> i starts it at 0 and goes to um, k. Yeah, so there's a, there's, a, there's a good fence post problem here, right? You have one more of these uh, endpoints than you do intervals, right? Like you have 1, 2, 3, 4 intervals, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 endpoints. Yeah, good catch. All right. So for example, if we do the, the composite midpoint rule, all we do is sum up over each interval the width of the interval times f of the midpoint. Yeah. If we do the trapezoid rule, we, we do a similar thing, where now we average the endpoints, and we'll apply that by the width of the interval. But notice that now this is really two sums, right? This, this plus sign on the first row could be broken up. And if we reshuffle it a little bit, we see that in fact what we're doing is we're, we're adding up f at all of our interior sample points. It turns out you need a one half on either end. 
and, and multiplying that by the wave frequency. These are equivalent formulas. You see how you get from the first to the second just by breaking the sum up and being that simple? Cool. All right. Similarly, for the composite Simpsons rule, this actually was interesting. It took me, your, your textbook mentions it, but then doesn't write down a formula, and it turns out very few books do. Uh, and there's good reason, which is that it's kind of a weird formula. Um, so the idea of the, co the composite Simpson, and let me draw why this is a little bit strange. The composite Simpsons rule, you would kind of expect it to do something smart, like have a bunch of parabolas that somehow meet up with tangent continuity, but it turns out that that's not what it does. So the composite Simpsons rule, generally, so let's see if I can draw a function that, that, that will do something weird. So let's say I have a function that looks like this. Again, you notice it's really hard to construct these to, to work out the way you want. Um, yeah, with endpoints here and here. Okay, like that. Okay. So Simpson's rule needs three points. So all we're going to do is just keep dividing things into groups of three. Okay? And then fit a parabola to each of them and integrate that. Right? So the first right? So the first curve will look like this. And then the second curve will look like that. Here's the thing. At this joint, we have no guarantee that it's more than continuous. You might actually, for example, let's say that uh, my function looks like that, right? And then if I'm unlucky and sampled like this, right, then I would get this parabola and then that parabola. And because of that, it's not entirely clear that this integration scheme is any better than trapezoid or midpoint, even though we added an additional data point. Yeah. On the flip side, if we did enforce tangent continuity, for example, if we tried to use a spline, uh, you would also have some kind of weird behavior, because it turns out that then, if you perturb any one of these data points, it would affect the entire, uh, the entire interpolation. Yeah. So the, these schemes are really subtle. You have to be very careful how you just that. Okay. So I would say a reasonable question to ask right now is which of these different rules is actually the one that you should take? Right? We just wrote down like five different quadrature rules and they're all kind of reasonable approximations of an integral. So, so who cares? Why do we use all of these things? Or are they all the same in the limit? Or what have you? Yeah, I hope it's a reasonable question. Okay, so to that end, uh, let's do a little bit of math on the board. And hopefully I won't screw it up, but given our track record, we'll see. Right. So uh, one way to do this is to do a little bit of error analysis, uh, depending on the quadrature scheme you use, uh, to help illustrate when uh, you're, you're going to get values that sort of look like what you'd hope for. So for now, we're going to assume that A and B are close together. So we kind of want to see, you know, does, does our error grow like delta x squared cubed and so on. Right. So to that end, let's define C to be equal to just the midpoint a plus b over 2. Yeah? Then a really handy formula, it turns out, for these proofs is to tailor expand the function f about this point c. By the way, whenever we discuss uh, these, these methods, you can assume your functions are, are analytic, that, that you can take their Taylor series and, and they behave. We're not going to deal with the case with them. Okay. So, in particular, we know that f of x, at least in a neighborhood of c, is equal to f of c plus uh, two, 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 f prime of c times x minus c plus one half f prime prime of c times x minus c squared. We're actually going to need quite a few terms. Plus one six f prime 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 of c x minus c cubed plus, and I think that's enough. If it's not, we'll, we'll go back and ask the terms later. Okay? 